Remember, God is interested in more than external behavior. This is not about simply defining lines and then staying on the right side of them. This is different. This is more profound. This is Christianity. God wants you to not simply behave better. He wants you to think rightly and love higher and obey out of a sense of gratitude. In other words, he wants to change your heart. Don't ever address an area of sin in your life and just think, okay, I'm just going to mortify this. You want to mortify sin. That is good. That is right. That is biblical. But God wants more. He wants your motive to be better, more biblical. What is the motive? <laughs> I only want to do things that please God because I love him so much. That is what sanctification is about. Never simply clean up the outside of the cup on yourself, on your children, on your co-workers, on your fellow church members. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus and keep your eyes focused on the heart, not merely externals, even when it comes to the issue of self-control. Scripture never expects us to hear God's command separate from our focus on God's work for us in the person of His Son. And when we divorce these things, then we almost inevitably go wrong. Religion says, become by self-effort what you're not. Christianity, Christian faith says, become by grace what you are. Become by grace what you are, because you have been set free, 2 Corinthians 5, in order that you might live for him. And Paul says we make it our goal to please him is the bullseye for the Christian sin. Are we supposed to be constantly focusing on our shortcomings, our failures, our wrong desires, and simply try to really gut it out so that we don't do those things anymore? No. The bullseye in sanctification is studying Jesus more and thus becoming more like him. God is our goal. From that flows the mortification of sin. Now that Alistair Begg has established a broader understanding of the issue of self-control, prepare yourselves. He's going to potentially get a wee bit personal here. Are you lazy? Are you lazy? Then it's an issue of self-control. Do you, do you refuse to take rest and recreation? You're out of control. Are you and I prepared to eat and eat and eat? It's a self-control deal. Or drink and drink and drink. It's a self-control. Are we prepared to live within the bounds of biblical sexuality? Or are we going to imbibe the spirit of the world? No, I'm not doing my Carol Burnett impression, but while that pastor was preaching, I felt like I got tagged. What about you? You say, nope. I'm good in all those areas. Well, what about the arena of your emotions? In terms of our emotions, self-control. Do you have a spirit of resentment or of bitterness or of self-pity or just a flaming temper? Incidentally, to have a temper that requires being brought under self-control is not a mark of ungodliness. To fail to control it is a mark of ungodliness. Come on. He tagged you with your emotions, and if you're saying, not me, I'm good to go in that department, you need to talk to your family. Let your family judge the stability of your emotions. Ask your friends, do you see areas in my emotional life that are a little 
out of control. Talk to people with whom you attend a church. Ask them, let them into your life. How do you think I'm doing emotionally? Because we don't judge ourselves well. We should let others do that for us. And if we are willing to listen, we'll recognize that we've got some emotions that are out of control. Bad emotions that are out of control. Lust, hatred, but it could even be good desires out of control like love and affection. Those things are good, but we cross the line when we crave, must have, or participate in those good things too much. So how do we draw that line? I do believe the great theologian Barney Fife can be helpful during this conversation about self-control when he says, nip, nip, nip it in the bud. We need then to learn to nip these things in the bud. We need to learn to be honest about temptation. We need to say to ourselves, I can't put myself in those vulnerable places. Because the day when, as Sinclair Ferguson has told us, the day when desire and opportunity and temptation combine, that's a tough day. Desire, opportunity, and temptation. You're really up against it that day. If you've got desire and no opportunity, what are you going to do? If you're tempted, but you've got no desire, who cares? Desire, opportunity, and temptation. Watch out for that day, because when they combine, it's deadly. How do we avoid that day? The recipe is simple. Baking that cake, I, I, my food metaphor got a little mixed up, but the point is it's not easy to do what he's describing. It is crystal clear in the Bible how we get our emotions, our affections, our attitudes, our actions under control. There is one key and his name is Jesus. Study him. When you focus on him constantly, regularly, deeply, not mystically, but study him, talk to him, worship him, you will become more like him. And I guarantee you, Jesus' emotions were never out of control. If you do not know how to help somebody who is struggling with emotional issues due to infertility, sexual abuse, miscarriage, self-harm, you will, if you get tried by biblical counseling, too.